So, good morning everyone. My name is Jan and I came to from Poland and I work in the automotive industry. And I got a question for you all. Is anyone here who works in automotive industry as well as a programmer or developer? You are the guy. Okay, what is the uh, language version which you are using in your project? Is it C++ 14, 17 or 20? 98? Yeah, I've, I've been to such project three years ago. There was a kind of a big code base in 98 C++. It's like programming in this kind of language. It's like programming without arms, you know? You need to talk to computers. You're like, whoa, what's going on there? I cannot do this stuff. And you, what do you use? Uh, well, we have a project that's like Java. Uh -huh. <laughs> ah, okay, yeah. So most of the projects in automotive industry now, they are based on C++ 14. And recently, some of them are moving, which is a very innovation move, to the C++ 17. And uh, there's a kind of problem because when you are, uh, when the new standard reaches, is published, um, then we have these conferences when we talk about new exciting features and their use cases. However, automotive industry says like, nah, no, nah, I don't want it, not yet. And then we wait. And after several years, they introduce it to their code base, which is super innovative move. For example, the coroutines will be available in the automotive industry, when in other domains, we will treat them as a legacy code. But this talk is not about the um, automotive programming, but it presents a kind of general questions which are valid since C++11. And I'll be talking about the dependency injection and abstraction techniques, the way in which, which you can, we can use to a, write a generic and loosely coupled code in C++. And at the end of it, we'll try to answer the question why the standard committee decided to use different abstraction technique for passing the deleter to unique pointer and to start pointer. So uh, passing the deleter to those very closely related types. And C++ is a Georges language. Every simple problem, every single one, has at least 10 or more possible solutions. When I was preparing for this talk, I was reasoning about how to iterate over std tuple. Uh, basically, I wanted to achieve a kind of for each function, which takes a std tuple as an input parameter and some kind of callable, which we can invoke on each of these elements. With C++ 11, we could use the Sphini and compile time recursion. Then we move to the C++14, for, for which we can change the Sphini to the if const expert. And with C++17, we can use the std apply and fold expressions. All of those uh, techniques are doing well. All of those do the stuff which, are perform which, which, the, which we want them to do. So how we can choose the best possible solution? Quality attributes can be treated as a kind of non-functional requirements, and they can come in hand when we need to choose the best solution. Performance efficiency. This quality attribute is kind of the most famous and important for our domain. Basically, you choose C++ as your main application language because you care about the resources. Under these quality attributes, we can find, for example, how fast our program processes the input data due to time constraints, or how much memory does it use due to platform constraints. But this quality attribute is not the only one which we should care about. Portability, how hard it is to run my application on some other platform with different hardware architecture, operating system, or libraries. Flexibility, how easy it is to extend, modify, or reuse my component. And the last one, simplicity. Uh, what knowledge level is required to maintain the code base? Um, how experienced needs to be a developer to understand it? Unfortunately, there is no silver bullet. Promoting one of those quality attributes downgrades the other. We always face a trade-off. Decoupling software components, we can partition into three phases. First, we need to identify how we want to partition our code and find dependencies and connections between them. Oh. Next, we need to choose the proper abstraction technique. 
And finally, we need to decide how to inject the dependency instance, which will be accessed through an abstraction layer from another component. And let's shortly talk why we need abstractions. First of all, they reduce the problem. Component A, B, and C, they all together solve one big problem. But if we partition it to three modules, then we can have three smaller problems to solve. And the developer who is working on component C, he doesn't need to care about internal implementation details of component B. He just needs to care about the required interface, the contract between those two components. They make the code loosely coupled. We can change the implementation of component B, and as long as it fulfills the contract, the component C can remain unmodified. And they make the code testable. By mocking the dependencies, we can test in isolation different component, having tests for even hard to trigger use cases, conditions, or corner cases. And portability is especially important for embedded development. Such project usually operates on a custom platform in constrained environment. Especially at the beginning stage of project, there is lack of hardware. There is not enough target devices for every developer or the hardware seems to be unstable. Hiding the platform dependent code behind an abstraction layer allows us to mock it and continue work on our application without the target device. What is more, some useful profiling tools can be not available for our platform. And I have a question here. Who uses the address sanitizer on a daily basis on a kind of similar tool which I'm not aware of, but which is better? Do you use these guys on a daily basis, the address sanitizer? So if you're not, I really recommend to start using it. It's a great tool. It, for me, several years ago when I was introduced to it, it was a kind of game changer. And it is really awesome tool to find C++ specific bugs. OK, let's now take a look at code design from a higher perspective. My favorite way to evaluate the quality of it is to take particular components, it can be a class, a group of classes, or a source file, and try to use it without the rest of the project, checking how hard it is to provide dependencies for it in order to use its functionality shows if different components in my software are loosely coupled. And this is often the way I start to work with a legacy code base. By writing or implementing such a prototype, it helps me identify the responsibilities and connections between different parts of the software. In C++, we can divide uh, pro uh, abstraction techniques into two main categories. The static polymorphism based on templates and runtime polymorphism based on virtual functions and inheritance. In general, we can say that static polymorphism promotes the performance, while runtime polymorphism promotes flexibility. Now let's say a few words about performance. Compiler is a tool which can optimize your code. And the bigger the picture shown to the compiler, the better optimization it may perform. One of the fundamental techniques employed by the compiler is a function inlining. And this opens the following optimization opportunities. For example, loop unrolling on removing some un unobservable statements. And those following duties, they can be performed on a bigger chunk of the code. However, it is impossible to inline the indirect call, the truly indirect call, because its address is provided at runtime. What is more, even when we put two nested functions into separate translation units, they cannot be inlined at compile time. There is a link time optimization, however, it is not as efficient as a compile time one. And this is why of the, one of the reasons why, in general, we can say that templates, which are usually header only, promotes the performance. And now let's take a short look at the memory. CPU access the memory through the cache due to the fact that memory is much slower than the CPU. A cache is a smaller and faster memory located closer to a CPU core, which stores the copies of data from main memory. Most CPUs have a hierarchy of multiple cache levels. The closer we get to the CPU, the faster the memory access is. However, its size 
decreases. When CPU needs to read the data for the first time from the memory, it is propagated through all of the levels of cache. And when the CPU tries to read the same value again, and it's already in cache, it just loads it from it. And this is done automatically by hardware. However, we can write the generic code which benefits from it. A cache miss occurs when CPU wants to access particular memory address which is not already in cache. And cache misses can be a bottleneck for efficient execution of a program. For example, sequential access to contiguous memory buffer is often much, much faster than random access to distant memory chunks. But performance is a complex and broad topic with a lot of statement starting with it depends on the context. And if there is one thing which I'm sure about the performance, it is don't make assumptions, but measure and benchmark. Let's now take a look at first widely used uh, abstraction technique, the runtime polymorphism. Runtime polymorphism is based on inheritance and virtual functions. Here we define an abstract class with pure virtual method. Now let's add two concrete implementation to this interface the cat and dog. To have a loosely coupled code, we should access their functionality via a reference or a pointer to a base class, that's language constraint. First thing needs to be done when invoking a virtual function of such object. It's first, we need to uh, find or locate the virtual, the, its virtual pointer needs to be located. Then this pointer will direct us to the table of functions specified for the underlying type. And from this table, we need to access the address of functions we want to invoke. And this process is called runtime binding. Boring stuff, and uh, most of you probably is uh, experts in this, but keep the code simple and easy to understand. It's very important quality attribute. How can other components use those concrete type via a generic interface. When it is enough to access dependency in a single function, then really good choice is to pass it by reference, use it in a function scope, and forget about it. Thanks to such implementation, the component doesn't need to care about the life scope of past object. It will be valid for entire function call, and that's the responsibility on the client. But what if the function scope is not enough? What if we need to access to the same dependency instance between multiple calls? We can inject a dependency as a constructor parameter, store it as a member field, and use it in related functions. But we do not want to make our code uh, tightly coupled. We want to program to abstractions instead of concrete type. So such technique gives us two alternatives. We can store it as a reference or a pointer to a base class. What if we choose to store it as a reference? In presented example, the pet owner stores his member via reference to abstract class, but the reference doesn't participate in the life scope of the underlying object. Moreover, the pet owner doesn't have any way to check if its, under, if it's stored pet is still valid. So such decision makes the user of pet owner tightly coupled to this implementation detail. The client code needs to make sure that the instance of injected dependency is valid for entire life scope of pet owner. On the other hand, thanks to this, the implementation of pet owner is very simple. There is even a remark in core guidelines about this. Never transfer ownership by a row pointer or reference. But what if we don't want to put such responsibility on the client code? What if our goal is to transfer the ownership? We can obviously use smart pointers. They make another constraint on the client code, that dependencies needs to be dynamically allocated. But on the other hand, the ownership, they handle the ownership in a clear, automated, and treatable way. We can use stood shared pointer or unique pointer when our component needs to own dependencies and still access them through the base class, through the abstraction layer. If we don't want to participate in life scope of injected dependency, we can store it as a weak pointer. 
Every time we would like to use the underlying object, we can check if it's still valid and lock it in order to participate in the ownership during a short scope. And such functionality can be used, for example, to implement an observer pattern. In observer pattern, we have two generic types, the subject and observers. Subject uh, can notify the observer whenever some particular interesting event happens. Observers can dynamically register and unregister in runtime to the subject on those notifications. Often, the subject instance is not owner of the observers. It doesn't want to participate in their life scope. If such use case is if in such use case, it is worth to consider storing the observers as a collection of weak pointer in the subject. Thanks to such decision, there will be no dangling reference whenever some observer implementation will forget to unregister from a subject on its destruction. On the other hand, it makes the constraint on the client code that the observer needs to be stored as a shared pointer. And this idea was described in a Scott Mayer's book, Effective Modern C++. We've already seen a way to inject dependency when using runtime polymorphism. One way to pass it via reference as a function parameter. Another way is to pass it in constructor and use it in a class scope. But this forces us to have some logic to not to end up on a path to undefined behavior. Setters allows to change the injected implementation during runtime. And this empowers flexibility. But what if the client code will invoke a public function before setting up dependency? To protect against this, we, we will have to validate it every time we want to use it. To avoid such pollution of conditional statement through the code base, consider introducing an invariant that there is always a valid dependency instance through the entire life scope of your component. And if such invariant is not capable, consider storing the dependency as a, for example, std optional. In general, we can say that runtime polymorphism promotes flexibility. We don't need to know the concrete types during compilation. We can change the injected dependency in runtime. Concept of virtual functions is clear to most of developers, even from other programming languages. Due to fact that we need to access dependency via reference to, to its, or, or a pointer to its base class, we need additional logic to take care of the life scope. But sometimes we don't need such flexibility, or we would like to to our software to be more efficient. On the other hand, we don't want to give up on a generic, loosely coupled code. Compile time polymorphism is another abstraction technique. Here we have two classes, the dog and the cat, both having public function feed. However, they do not share common base class. Let's see how we can use them in a generic way. The pet owner is a class template. Its dependency is injected through template parameter and concrete instance is constructed in place during, during pet owner initialization. Such technique allows us to have a generic code with a performance of a non-generic type. Due to the fact that we don't access the dependency through a base class, we don't need any additional logic to create owned object on dependency instance stored as a member field. On the other hand, each template instantiation is a different type. Take a look at these two aliases, dog owner and cat owner. They are both different types. This means that without additional abstraction layer, they cannot be stored in a homogeneous collections like std vector. They cannot be passed to the same function. And it's impossible to change the concrete type of dependency in runtime. And due to this fact, such technique is less flexible and can make the client code more complex. So how can we overcome this? The std variant is a variety class template added in C17, which represents a type safe union. As far as I remember, tomorrow Odin will talk more about this type, so I will just scratch its surface. 
An instance of std variant at any given time holds a value of its alternative types. And let's see now how we can change the pet owner class to make it more flexible. To use std variant as an abstraction technique, we need to change the pet owner class to a variadic template. The client code will pass all possible types during template instantiations, and those types would be set as alternatives for the std variant. It has a templated constructor. However, it doesn't affect the overall pet owner type. It just sets the chosen alternative. And the std visit passing current, is passing currently stored value in variant to the generic lambda. And such implementation has similar flexibility to one based on virtual functions. The main difference are that dependencies doesn't need to share the common base class. All possible types need to be provided during compilation, during template instantiation. And we don't need to access them via pointer or reference to a base class. But till now, we were looking at one-to-one -one relationship. Let's now have a look how we can modify this code to achieve one-to-many relationship so our pet owner will be able to have cat and dog or couple of dogs or couple of cats. Let's keep our pet as a vector of variants instead. Before, we had a templated constructor. Now we change it to the default one. We added new function template responsible for adding elements to vector. In the think fit function, we iterate over vector visiting each element. Thanks to such implementation, we store all of the dependencies in contiguous memory. On the other hand, the implementation of std visit usually generates a table of function pointer for every alternative of std variant. And this is similar to implementation of virtual functions. It can result in branch misprediction during iterating and executing function over it. Because the CPU can predict what kind of alternative is stored in next variant. But again, if there is one thing which I would like you to remember from this presentation is don't make assumptions about the performance. Modern compiler and modern hardware are really complex and powerful tools, and it is often very hard to have a complete view from a developer perspective. We'll now take a look at slightly different implementation of one-to-many relationship using the std tuple. Instead of vector of variants, we have a std tuple, which, is, which stores uh, several vectors, the unique vector for each of the uh, past te template type. So for each type, there is a unique contiguous memory buffer where we will store the instances. Again, we have a defaulted constructor. In add pet function, we find related vector and insert the new elements to it. The feed method can be seen as the for each function specialized for the std tuple. We can combine the std apply and fold expressions introduced in C17 with a variadic lambda to achieve a compact solution of a for each function for std tuple. As you can see, the API of both, web, of both versions is the same. So the client code, there will be no difference in the client code. What, can we, what, what quality attributes can we choose to make the best choice of such implementation? And the main difference between those two versions is how they use the memory. So let's compare it now. Imagine we have three types, dog, cat, mouse. The variant version, stores them in a single buffer. The tuple version stores them in several vectors. And now we will add, add, randomly add a pet to each of this uh, implementation. This is how it could look like the internal state of variant version. And this is the internal state of std tuple. With std variant, we have every pet next to each other. So iterating over such collection would be very efficient. However, the elements are not ordered by type, and this makes it almost impossible for the hardware to predict the next instructions, which can end up in less efficient code. What is more, 
the stud variant needs to be huge enough to fit the largest alternative types. So such implementation can end up with several unused bytes. The stud tuple version internal state is ordered by type. However, we cannot expect that underlying memory buffer for each vector will end up in contiguous memory next to each other. So iterating over single vector will be very efficient. However, switching between them can introduce a cache miss. Which implementation is better? Who thinks that tuple implementation is more efficient? And who thinks that variant implementation is more efficient? OK, you are all right. Because as we learned, never guess about performance, but measure it with different metrics. And imagine now how such memory snapshot would look like with, for a version implemented using runtime polymorphism. Concrete types needs to inherit from an abstract pet class. Pet owner stores them as a collection of uh, unique pointers to the base class. And Internal elements are not ordered by concrete type, so iterating over such collections and invoking some behavior on each sort of object would end up in several branch mispredictions. The same with what we have with std variant. Moreover, the underlying objects are not stored next to each other, so such implementation doesn't benefit from the cache access. Thanks to compile time polymorphism, we, have a, we can have a generic code which is as efficient as non-generic. On the other hand, all types need to be known during compilation time, and that is why, in general, we can say that it promotes the performance over flexibility. With compile time polymorphism, we can construct dependencies in place. We don't have a problem that access to concrete object needs to be performed via reference or a pointer to the base class. And as we said, different template instantiation is a different type. And this means that we cannot write a generic function which operates on them without additional abstraction layer. And each abstraction layer increases the complexity of the client code. The last abstraction technique which I will present is the type erasure. It is very flexible and allows us to store and operate the, on different types without the need of template or inheritance. Let's get back to the dog and the cat. They are public function fit, but they don't share common base class. First, we define an interface through which the component will access the concrete implementation. Next, we define the class template, which will inherit from mentioned interface and store the concrete implementation in its state. And now, based on this, we can create the pet owner class. As you can see, the pet owner is not the class template. It stores the dependency as a unique pointer to the base class, to the pet concept. The trick here is to have a templated constructor which concretes the concrete type the instantiation of the pet model, who receives, for example, dog and a cat as a template parameter, and stores it in a pointer to the base class, to the member field named pet concept. Thanks to such implementation, we don't force the dog and the cat to inherit from some common base class. What is more, the pet owner is not the class template, so instance holding a cat is the same type as instance holding a dog. The cost of such flexibility is code complexity, dynamic memory location, and um, indirect call for the virtual function. And I have a question here. Who at least once managed to implement a type erasure from scratch in a production code? OK. And who used the std function, for example? And that's uh, my advice. Whenever, because I'll be honest with you, I have never implemented the type erasure in a production code. Whenever I needed such flexibility, I employed std function. 
even it, if it has some overhead, I was I can af I could afford it because the type eraser brings more overhead as well. And I recommend to consider this technique every time we need a single function interface. Okay, we are done with the abstractions, but before we jump into answering the title question, let's talk a bit about the optimization technique, which was implied, which was used in standard tunic pointer. The empty base class optimization. Each object in C++ has at least one byte of size. And that is because the standard requires that each object must have a unique address. We don't pay this one byte overhead in non-empty types. The size of the int holder is the same as size of int. Let's now combine those two types in a single structure. In my particular machine, the size of empty in holder was eight bytes due to padding. But if we change this code and inherit from it, suddenly we don't need to pay for this overhead. And that's because thanks to inheritance, we can effectively hide the base class within the derived class. And after this, the compiler can wipe out the size of the empty base class. And std tuple takes advantage of it by a chain of inheritance. And many generic uh, types from a standard library stores their state as std tuple, for example, unique pointer. And thanks to this, the unique pointer with a stateless deleter uh, is the same in size as the managed pointer. Now we have reached the point when we are able to answer the question from the title. Why they decided to apply the different abstraction technique for the deleter, for the shared pointer and the unique pointer. When smart pointers reached the standard in C++11, the committee decided that unique pointer obtains its deleter as a template parameter, while stood shared pointer implements it using type erasure. So why two close related types achieves the same functionality in a totally different way? One of the design goals for the unique pointer was to provide a lightweight and efficient type that can be used in a wide range of scenarios. To achieve this goal, the standard committee decided to use a template parameter for studio, uh, to, to use template parameter to pass the deleter for std unique pointer. And this approach allows the deleter to be resolved at compile time, which can result in more efficient code and better optimization opportunities. What is more, thanks to empty base class optimization, the size of std unique pointer with a stateless deleter is the same as size of manage pointer. So we can describe it as a zero cost abstraction. Stood pointer, on the other hand, brings more overhead. It is implemented as two dynamic, dynamically allocated pointers, one to the managed object and another one to control block. In its control block, there are often two atomic reference counter, the weak counter and the shared counter. The deleter would end up in a control block, no matter what abstraction technique would we use. Applying it as a type erasure, resulted in more flexible type. And this design decision could be advocated as, if you can afford for the stood shared pointer for this overall cost, then the cost of types, type erase deleter is minor, is irrelevant. In summary, the standard committee decision was based on the trade-off between performance and flexibility, with unique pointer prioritizing performance and shared pointer prioritizing flexibility. Okay, now it's the bomb time. The bomb time. I will share with you my personal opinion about the event-driven architecture. This is the kind of architecture which is super decoupled. So when we abstract, 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 we can end up finally in the event-driven architecture. And we, we talked shortly about the observer pattern. Observer pattern applied on a much bigger scale can be described as an event-driven architecture. And this is very flexible pattern. When two components need to communicate, they do not depend on each other from the code perspective. 
Instead, they depend on the event bus and the events which are sent and received through this, through this bus. So we can say that when component A wants to receive a particular event, he doesn't care if it was sent by component B or by some other thing or by, by component C or whatever. He just cares that I received the event or I sent some such event. And this results in extremely loosely coupled code. But there is a cost of such flexibility. With event-driven architecture, it is often hard to understand the execution flow by reading the code. And that's because different components share the same event bus and processes the same message. So by statically reading the code, we don't see which actual function is invoked when some condition occurs, when some particular event is sent. To reason about the code, we often need to run the application and attach the debugger with perform the instruction stepping or check the logs. In 1968, Edgar Dijkstra wrote a famous manifest, go to statement considered harmful. And in my opinion, some of arguments provided by the scientist are applicable to the event-driven architecture. And I would like to make it clear. I don't make a statement that this pattern is wrong. I think the flexibility and loosely coupled code is a great benefit. However, there is non-obvious technical depth introduced by event-driven architecture, which we need to consider. Uh, thank you, guys. That was all I prepared for you today. Uh, I said before when I was introducing that at the end I would say if I like it or not and I enjoy it a lot. Thank you. So thank you very much. So uh, before questions, every time somebody mentions Edgar Dijkstra, uh, go to Consident Hanford, I cannot refrain to remember that that was not an article, that that was a letter to the editor and that the letter to the editor does not say as I see many uh, programming courses, professors in this and other universities never use go to. That is not what Edgar Deister said. Edgar Deister basically said, do not use non local go to to mimic control structures. So I'm sorry, I cannot refrain to re remind this because, like 90% of people, I'm not talking about you, <laughs> but 90% of, of people saying, Go to considering harmful, never read the letter to the editor that is just three pages. Now, questions. <laughs> yeah, uh, hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, you have uh, present three different ways to, to manage the, when you have different uh, uh, in a container, so one is with using the virtual function, the other is with the variants, and the other is uh, using a tuple. Uh, yeah, and you have said, yeah, the way to know it, which is which one is uh, better, which one is uh, is to try it. And I don't know, have you tried it, or do you know what is normally better for, it for a performance? On, it uh, totally depends on the context. How big are your structures? How many elements are these? And what's how look like the rest of the project? What's already in memory? Mm -hmm. So it totally depends on the context. But I think it's a good. Uh, staff to have a kind of uh, guidelines per project. So in project we say that we, for example, promote uh, virtual functions over template or the other way around. We don't use the runtime polymorphism. And in such case, you don't have a problem as a programmer because you know what are the guidelines. And if you have a good idea to not use the guidelines, then you need to advocate your decision. So everyone grows their knowledge, but we don't end up in a kind of pointless discussion on the on review board. OK, thanks. Any other questions? Other question? So uh, ah, OK. Uh, you showed a bit of. Um, an implementation of a polymorphic wrapper around the type to 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 make a statically polymorphic type uh, runtime polymorphic. 
You, you mean the type eraser? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then you advocated against it because you'd have to implement yourself. Uh, I believe Sean Parent has a generic implementation of that that you can just use. Okay, I will try it. Thanks. And then that, of course, reminds me uh, some parents talk inheritance is the base class of all evil. <laughs> More questions? It looks like you want fresh air and coffee. So go for the coffee and be back in half an hour. <laughs> <laughs>